on all of those fronts. Uh, and yeah, um, you know, we, in a simple world, we like to think we have one challenge uh, in the in the gut, you know, and that, that's just because we want to make it easier on ourselves. When when the reality is, you've got 15 different assaults uh, at least, and some yep. of them aren't even assaults. Some of them are just there. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, where we cover the latest in poultry nutrition uh, research and industry trends in approximately 10 minutes. Uh, my name is Sam Rocho. I'm a co-host of the show and uh, very excited to be uh, joined today by Dr. Uh, Rob Payne, who has uh, been in, in several roles in the poultry industry, uh, different parts of the world, and uh, going to talk a little bit about what he's currently doing uh, in his, his current position at Cargill and, and how they're looking at different feed additives and, and solutions for, for their customers. So uh, thanks for joining, Rob. Good, good to talk with you. Yeah, thanks, Sam. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and, and all the guests today. Uh, and yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just can you give us just a quick high level overview of kind of your, your path and, and, and what you're doing in your current, current position, what your role is and kind of what that entails at Cargill? Yeah, so um, I, I've been with Cargill Animal Nutrition as their uh, director of, of poultry nutrition and, and technical services now for for about four years. Um, my career, I, I I started my I went to grad school at LSU and then uh, was with Avonic Animal Nutrition for a long time for about thirteen years, uh, which. Uh, uh, in a variety of technical and marketing roles here in North America and Asia and, and globally. And, and ultimately that, uh, that brought me to Cargill, uh, and at, at Cargill, I'm, I'm responsible for all of our consulting nutrition, uh, which is we, we do consulting nutrition for a variety of roller Turkey and layer customers, uh, here in the U S and Canada, um, and in a variety of, production uh, scenarios, uh, be it conventional, organic, RWA, and NAE, whatever, you, however you want to call it. So, right. so it's a lot of fun, and it gives us a chance uh, to to work with a lot of different uh, nutrients and and feed additives. Uh, a lot of insights. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think that's a unique role that you have, um, in that you're, you know, kind of. Uh, overseeing a lot of different species, and I'm sure the management styles, feeding programs are probably all over the board, um, even within species and the things that you're dealing with. Um, but obviously, you know, enzymes have have kind of uh, settled in as far as we, we have a lot of feed additives that are very situational for different things. But, you know, enzymes seem to be pretty uh, common and particularly phytase. You know, we've uh, been using phytase for quite a while now. And, and I'm sure that's uh, pretty common across most of your production systems. Yeah, uh, you know, honestly, enzymes to me, uh, exogenous enzymes are after supplemental amino acids and and essential nutrients, uh, and and even maybe a, a, a additive like high D. Exogenous yeah. enzymes to me are. are almost as close to essential as, as we can have. Uh, you know, I was lucky enough when I started grad school, uh, to be involved in some of the very first work here in the U S on phytase, you know, a long, now a long time ago, uh, in pigs and get to develop some of the matrix values way back then. And I've been along for the ride ever since. And, and I've learned that enzymes have, so much they can do for us and and here at cargill we we uh certainly use a lot of enzymes we we certainly try to uh be progressive in our use of technology and and for us i would say enzymes are almost old hat uh and we try to look for every opportunity uh to get everything out of the nutrient uh everything out of the ingredient that is um you know from a digestible nutrient perspective and, and enzymes, whether it's phytase or xylanase or, or, uh, mannanase, uh, uh, and even some of the ones that are newer, the proteases and others, uh, they, they just 
help us so much, uh, especially with, you know, with ingredient costs being what they are today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I, I know you've kind of been, uh, you know, as you mentioned, at least from the commercial application of it and, and really understanding how we apply it in feed formulation, you were, you were there kind of in the early stages of that. I mean, can you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe if you can remember back to some of those first projects, like levels of enzymes and, and expected release of nutrients, kind of where we are now. And, you know, obviously we, we talk about super dosing and you still hear that term, but that's really just kind of the dose. Now people are using higher levels and, and, you know, probably, or we know we're getting more than just like, for example, when we talk about phytase more than just obviously phosphorus and, and calcium and mineral release there. So can you talk a little bit about how you've seen that change over, over your career? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I mean, I immediately were reminded of uh, 24 hour ileal cannula collections, which you probably remember or know about as well. Sure. Uh, but, yeah. you know, back then, very early on, there was really only one or two phytases at, at when we were starting, there was just one phytase on the market. And, and it didn't matter whether it was poultry or swine, uh, 600 FTUs, 500 FTUs was kind of the number uh, that, that everyone was talking about and all the research was was being generated around. And it's funny, you know, whatever, 30 years later uh, now, uh, in in certain species, we still have those lower inclusions uh, in, in layers, for example, we're still uh, 400 to 600 units is quite common. Uh, although there's a growing amount of research that that would show that up to 1500, 1800 could be okay and not have any eggshell quality concerns mm -hmm. or anything like that. Mm -hmm. On the on the broiler side and and maybe less so on the turkey side, we've we've really seen levels increase uh, substantially uh, uh you mentioned super dosing and and that's uh, like you said it, it's a word now it doesn't really doesn't mean maybe what it did uh, a few years ago uh, because that's just become the level but we see levels on the broiler side as high as 2500 units uh for us you know for our most of our customers most mainstream we're in the 1500 range uh, for for the meat bird side, uh, regardless of turkeys or rollers. Uh, and we're working our way up on the layer side, let's say. Uh, but, but, you know, it's a lot of research and a lot of years uh, with now uh, with uh, an enzyme that is pretty proven, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of players in the market now with very, very good enzymes. And so that that gives us a lot of confidence. We don't have the questions about variability and inconsistency that we did years ago. Uh, we, so we have a lot of confidence to push that and and really try to get everything out of the ingredients, uh, try to minimize those anti-nutritional factors as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when we talk about other enzymes, I mean, it's, it's, it, I think a lot of times phytase kind of set the bar pretty high as far as like what you can get out of an enzyme. And then, you know, obviously there are other effective enzymes for other substrates and we're learning more all the time about that. But, but clearly, you know, phytase is, is pretty remarkable. I mean, in my class, I always bring in, you know, a, a handful, whatever the equivalent of, of phytase and say, you know, you analyze this, there's no phosphorus. And then you show the equivalent of the, you know, dical that that replaces in the diet. And just, it, it's really hard to, for a student, you know, to understand that until they see like, man, that's really contributing a lot to, to the diet. So I, I love that exercise. Actually. Yeah. Well, and, and honestly, for us to be uh, 30 years into this with phytase and, and of course other enzymes as well, and sometimes there still be a question about uh, the, the usefulness of a phytase. Uh, yeah, you know, a couple right. of years ago, we had a major phosphate shortage, uh, and uh, we had a lot of customers who could not get phosphates, and you know that opened the door uh, to to finally uh, get them uh, to embracing these enzymes. Uh, these technologies work, uh, and and uh, I'm I'm a big fan uh, for helping, if only to help us uh, stretch out those finite uh, sources like phosphates and other things allows us to use them longer. Uh, we don't have to use as much per ton of feed 
Uh, mm -hmm. And you know that whether it's whether it's phosphates or it's um, these anti-nutritional factors that that we really didn't know much about. Uh, you know when when I was in school and maybe even when you were in school, carbohydrates were largely benign. That's what we were told, and you know it was. Dr. Fahey's work and others that helped us yeah. open our eyes about uh, fiber and and that it was not just one component. Uh, and, and so fascinating for me. I could talk about it for days. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. You know, and it's, I mean, I was lucky enough at Illinois to be able to take Dr. Fahey's class and, and learn, you know, from him on that and, and very interesting. And, and yeah, I mean, fiber, you know, that's the one I... I think we're learning more and I, there's some innovative people out there on fiber, but it's still, you know, largely a, a black box as far as what, you know, what the bird needs, what type, you know, what the potential uh, gut health microbiome, all of that is, is, you know, it, it moves so fast. I can hardly keep up with it, but uh, I think we are learning a lot of uh, useful information. I mean, where do you think we're going, you know, now, I mean, Phytases, can they get much better? Where are we going there? Is it is it more the emphasis going to be on other enzymes? You think other substrates um, moving forward? Yeah, I, at least from my perspective, I I don't know how much better phytases can get. I think we can continue to learn how to use them more and more effectively. Um, but at some point, we we're gonna. Um, run out of substrate let's say we're gonna we're gonna tap yeah. as much of the substrate as we possibly can i i think that's where the other classes of enzymes be it the xylanases the mannanases the proteases are all so fascinating one because like you said we we know in some cases like with mannins um mannins up to a certain level in the diet don't appear to have any negative effect but above that level have a pretty profound effect uh and so how do we how do we manage that how do we use enzymes to manage that um i think there's still a lot of education that has to be done um i don't think we understand uh those uh whether it's the fiber components or the non-starch polysaccharide components as well yet as we need to uh mm -hmm. and and then you see something like a protease I think proteases are fascinating, and I think they were largely misunderstood uh, when they first came out. Uh, they were they were probably thought to be too um, too general protein uh, uh, effect. And what we're finding is that no, they they have a very specific protein effect, but it might not be the protein we were expecting them to to work on. Right. Yeah. So uh, you know, I th I think anyone who's young in the industry or, or in grad school, there's a ton of work that can be done with enzymes still. And there's a, there's so much for us to understand still to, for, for years and years to come, I believe. With science led solutions that are sustainable, proven and effective BASF helps you tackle the challenges of poultry nutrition. We offer high quality feed ingredients that enable a more sustainable production and help you achieve your animal performance targets. We call it the science of sustainable feed that succeeds. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And then, you know, as you look at the the interactions among the release of these substrates and just kind of how that changes the overall dynamics, particularly when you talk about NSPases, because as you mentioned, you know, when you think about just one of those components uh, or one carbohydrate component, say mannans, you know, it's going to depend definitely on the level, but then also on the level of the other components in the diet, other carbohydrate components. So when you look at these individuals, it's, it's really hard. I mean, yeah, you could spend a career just kind of teasing out like what's happening there for sure. So, well, and, and right now we really don't have the analytics, uh, to really, the, the quality of the analytics just isn't there yet to analyze some yep. of these components as well as we need to, to characterize them. And, and so I think there's a tremendous, uh, opportunity and on, all of those fronts. Uh, and yeah, um, you know, we, in a simple world, we like to think we have one challenge uh, in the, in the gut, you know, and that, that's just because we want to make it easier on ourselves when, when the reality is you've got 15 different assaults uh, at least. And some yep. of them aren't even assaults. Some of them are just there and, and like, like phytate, you know, and let, 
phytates binding nutrients uh, and making mm -hmm. them unavailable where manins are actually uh, causing damage. So you have this idea of nutrient sparing versus nutrient liberating and, and just so much to learn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, we appreciate your, uh, your insight. And uh, again, you have a, you know, a, a unique opportunity and to, to see a lot of different species and, and s production systems at one time. So it's, uh, it's neat to kind of hear your perspective on that from, from, from that level. So we appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks. We'll look forward to having you on the next one. And uh, thanks again for, for joining in on the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Uh, please uh, follow the show on your favorite platform and uh, look forward to the next one. Thanks again. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. And if you have a poultry nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it and share it with us, feel free to email the research link, uh, the paper where we can find it or the abstract to hello at wisenetics.com. That's hello at wisenetics.com. And I look forward to hearing from you.